everyone. Welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm Ashley Smith, and today we welcome board-certified animal naturopath Thomas Sandberg. Thomas is the founder of Long Living Pets Research Project, a 30-year observational study into longevity in dogs and cats. He's here today to discuss how to make pets live long, healthy lives, disease-free. He'll include his strategies to lower the risk of cancer. Thomas has a primary focus on a balanced raw diet and other holistic strategies. We don't get to talk about animals enough on Cell TV, and I'm excited to dedicate this episode to our fur babies. So let's get started and welcome Thomas Sandberg and, of course, Dr. Pompa. Welcome, both of you. Well, thank you. Glad to be yeah. here. Welcome, Thomas. You know, um, you actually found me because my wife wrote an article on what we do with our dogs. I actually even did a Facebook Live on you know, we feed our dogs raw and, you know, my, my 11 year old, you know, he runs 10, 15 miles still with me behind a mountain bike and my five year old, no problem. <laughs> but anyways, uh, you reached out to us. I said, gosh, we, we have to get him on cell TV because these topics, these are topics people want to hear about. How do I feed my dog for longevity and health? It's not what you think. You know, what about supplementation? What about detox? What about vaccines, exercise? I mean, all of these things, I think are topics that people need to know about, right? And, you know, this is an area of expertise um, that's been a study of yours for a long time. So, yeah, with that said, Thomas, let's just, let's jump right into diet. I mean, I think that's the big one. Uh, you go to the pet store, and, and by the way, folks, I'll link the article that my wife wrote here. Uh, Ashley will put that in for you, and um, I think that'll be a big help. And then we're also going to add all Thomas's links uh, to just because he has a wealth of knowledge and in all these topics, you're going to want to educate yourself. I promise you. Okay. Diet, right? Uh, you go into the pet store and you see all of the, the different foods. Um, you know, I would say less and less are having the grain in them before they all had grain in them, but dogs aren't meant to eat grain. I think most of my viewers know that or at least believe that, but now it's um, this, about raw, right? I mean, why raw? I mean, this is what my dogs, I would say, is why they live so long healthy. So what about raw versus all these other foods that they see in the pet store? Yeah, for me, so uh, this started about, no, it started 20 years ago, but I remember my parents back in Norway. I'm from Norway, that's when you have that accent. They <laughs> fed raw, you know, all the time. I never even thought about it before I really came here that the food was different and i saw these beautiful kibble bags and you know they they make the most beautiful packaging of anything it makes it you know see actually pieces of raw meat on the bag the problem with raw uh, with the uh, with uh, that food is is it was never designed for what uh, the a dog is and the dog is a carnivore and that's a whole other discussion because there is you know some people now claim dogs are evolved into omnivores which i'm not well I, I would argue that their their intestinal tract length hasn't changed i mean no. <laughs> you know, we, their canine i mean when we look at how we identify what a carnivore is uh has anything changed there i mean what why do they say nothing that? absolutely nothing and the time been too short for change if you think it changed it had what would it change anyway uh -huh. but if it changed because of the kibble food, that, that time of change, so evolve into some different type of species is way, way, way too short. That takes thousands of thousands of years to change that. So dogs are still the whole, it, the whole from the mouth to the intestines is all screams carnivores. It's a yeah. super fast system. He has little or no ability to digest any type of vegetables or fruits. So it, it is, they are carnivores, and carnivores by definition are, are flesh eaters. And the way they eat is hunt down something and eat it, something wild. And we don't want that to happen, so we just need to mimic that. And, and we're not mimicking that with kibble. Kibble is completely changed from the resources. I mean, the resources might be there, they started maybe as raw meat and things like that, but they, they cooked the, anything you know, living in there, they say cook to death. Right, so what, what's typically in a typical dog food? I mean, I know grains, which my gosh, I, you know, people make the argument humans shouldn't even eat grains, but, yeah. um, but uh, you know, there's grains, there's a lot of other things. What, what's in there? 
Well, the, the starting with, the, I mean, it could be any, I, I don't even know exactly what's in there, honestly, but there are, the things that goes to the rendering plant are maybe been meat at, the, at, at one point, but uh, they can legally take any animal that die on the field for any reason, they can be shipped to the rendering plant. They can take dogs in kill shelters. They can legally send that to the uh, rendering plant. And they have found in, and there, that's not long ago, maybe a year or two ago, the, uh, year ago they found the, the poison they used to kill dogs in shelters in dog food, traces of that. So we know dogs are coming from, from that. And then they have all kinds of fillers now they have started to using vegetables and some other things instead of the grain, but it's mostly some type of meal product mm -hmm. or meat product that it, it, you yeah. know. Yeah. So I mean, you're seeing more grainless products on the market. I mean, because we know, I mean, people now. I think even vets now uh, are coming around to the fact. Okay, grain causes pre, you know, arthritis and other problems in dogs. So now we're seeing grainless products. But talk about those products because even they're falling way short. Which ones? Sorry, grainless products that you're seeing in the the growth. You know, growth, you're seeing oh, more yeah. of those. Yeah, no, you know, to be honest with you, I, I I don't follow exactly what they put in there because I'm all focused about the feeding a raw food diet and okay. what you're now putting in there. Uh, I mean, one of the things I mean, I've realized is it's it's still loaded with way too many things. I mean, from tubers, potatoes to I mean, all kinds of fruits. Um, they, they yeah, that's really, what they do. Yeah, the pudding, yeah. So, vegetables, potatoes, and those things are yeah, uh, exactly. instead of so the grain. Grainless, but it still has very little meat, and the meat that's in it is um, not organic, and who knows what it is. Okay, so why? Well, the, why problem, the, the, the main problem with the whole process is the, it is the heating. It's the heat it two or three times to kill any type of bacteria, and, uh, and, that, and that denature anything that's in there, especially the meat. Even changing the, the composition of the amino acids, I mean, amino acids get locked into different type of chains that the body can unlock later in the stomach, and and they become a foreign product to the to the to the dog, especially a carnivore that don't recognize this. Oh, How old is your dog? And uh, he's, he's ten, and then you can tell it's just that. What, what kind of dog is he? He's a Great Dane. Yeah, I thought I had Great Danes. I was like, is that a mix? Oh, you did? I, uh, no, okay, that's enough. That's and enough. so, but, matter of fact, okay, let, let's talk about that, right? Because standard food, I had a Great Dane, and my Great Dane died at seven, which many of the big dogs do. They get bloat, the stomach flips. Now, I didn't know to feed my dog raw then. How, um, how old is um, he? And then, um, uh, and how long can you expect the big dogs to live if you feed them raw? Well, my, my Dane lives into the teens, mid-teens, which is pretty much double the lifespan, double, very close, yeah, very close. And I see others do the same in, in, in giant breeds. And, um, and that's basically because we now feed what the body is, or the, their digestive system is designed to, to, to take the nutrients from, and that's raw meat. And then, and a variety of raw meat. If you can feed two or three different proteins, and then also add two or three different uh, organ meats, then you are down ninety-five percent of the uh, and bones, of course, some bones that you want. So to I mean, you know, it, in the wild, I mean, you know, my dog will eat grass periodically and grab some other thing. You know, animals do eat a little bit of roughage and foliage. What is the percentage? So if you're buying a raw food, and that's going to be another question, like what what food raw food do you recommend, and and how to we recommend this, but I mean, should there be some percentage of vegetable or roughage in there at all? Or just straight? Well, this is where I differ from uh, some raw feeders, and uh, but I have many in my study that, that I have over 6,000 raw fed dogs in my study, and I have many doing the same. I'm one of those that don't believe in the, that they have no benefit whatsoever from mm -hmm. vegetables and fruits. I don't okay. feed anything. In 20 years, my dogs have never gotten one piece of fruit or vegetables. Mm. And many that doesn't agree with me on that, but there are also many that do the same and have the same great results. They well, eat I mean, it, they can eat it fine. That's no problem. I, and I'm not against it in that sense, but I don't see how they benefit from it because they, they really missing vital enzymes to break this down and also the ability for fermentation. And you need that fermentation to be able to take the nutrients from vegetables and fruits. Yeah. Cellulose, yeah, it's very hard to break down. And and you know when you this is what 
it 20 years ago or something when I really figured out because I started with the BARF diet here in the States and that has a you know normally has 10 to 20 percent vegetable or fruits in it and my dog had constant diarrhea like, you know I added up the bone I took fat out of the diet and still had diarrhea so one day I'm looking at his poop because that's the one I was you know figuring out if I'm doing the right thing I'm looking at his poop and I see this beautiful green grass in his poop that came from him, you know, went through the whole system. And I said, wait a minute, I just fed my dog, you know, the, private, the meal that actually came out when that was fed, that was like some big chunks of bones in there. There were had some, uh, some big wings and there was some thighs in there. There was quite a bit of bones because I had to feed on my 25% bones to keep the stool normal. So the dog is actually breaking down the bone fine. It's not a piece of bone in there, but that little piece of grass survived the whole process. So I realized there's something seriously wrong here. Why am I feeding these vegetables? And I saw bits of blueberries, bits of carrots and things like that when I feed it's in the poop. So they, it, they don't digest it. So Yeah, and, and honestly, if my dog, I mean, sometimes an animal will eat that uh, just to, you know, for their stomachs upset, they eat grass, right? But he'll eat it you know, by himself outside anyway. Well, there are two things I found out because I, I, I research this a lot now and there's some trends I'm seeing. I'm not saying I'm right and wrong, but this is what I would not believe is that there is a mineral deficiency that creates this the urge to eat grass mm. and dirt and sticks and things like that. So if you supplement with more trace minerals, you will see a difference. And now the big one is iodine. I think all humans and dogs are deficient in iodine because there really isn't any iodine in the food. Yeah. And I think you know that more than I do actually. Mm -hmm. So I actually, my Dane, the Udin, which is the other one I have is eight years old. He was double vaccinated within a week before I got him. Got him out from some, some drug raid over in Wyoming and they called me, can you take one of the Danes please? And it was a big like a difficult story so i took him and i later found out this would be vaccinated twice because they mixed up the dogs so I gave the same dog twice to them oh. before they realized that it was yeah so he had been a mess a lot not a really mess but one thing i could never never fix is a very itchy chest like really hot spots here they could have touched his chest and his legs start going like crazy you know they did the itching and he has ears, yeasty ears most of the time and, and, and eyes running. It took me five years to figure it out. And what it was, it was iodine. I just start to put the two or three drops of iodine in this mm. food and within a week, everything was gone. Wow. Now, that's and the weirdest crazy. way I found, I just woke up in the middle of the night. This is how I find things because I read way, way too much. And I can't digest it all. And I just woke up in the middle of that and all I was thinking about, put iodine in the food. I, don't, I didn't even know why I did it. And I did it, and it worked. You know, I'm going to make the argument. See, people would go, well, why, you know, don't dogs need certain vitamins? Well, look, the, the cows eat the grass. Yeah. And, you know, and then obviously they're getting a certain amount of nutrients. And then when the animal, when the dog eats the meat, they're getting those nutrients in a very bioavailable form. Yes. Because, you know, when the, your dog tries to eat the vegetable, they're not getting the nutrients. But the cow eats it, and then it's in the meat. Yes. That's what they're designed. So they're Absolutely. designed to get the nutrients from the meat that the cow eats the grass that gets the nutrients. So, you know, understand that. And then also, just like humans, Thomas, is that when a human is in a state of ketosis mm -hmm. um, or in a carnivore diet, they don't need the antioxidants because the, the, the fuel source changes. So that when the glucose is really low, you don't mm -hmm. need all the antioxidants that the world tells you you need, right? Yeah, yeah. So same with dogs in a carnivore diet. The antioxidant needs are so little, right? Yeah. Um, because they're not producing all the glucose. Yeah. Well, and a good thing about dogs that humans can't do, they can produce their own vitamin C and they're pretty good at it. That's right. Yeah. So, so they, they get that from the raw food diet. So you, I mean, I, people tell us to feed my dog, give my dog vitamin C. I said, no, it's no point. Mm -hmm. It's probably going to get destroyed in the stomach and never, ever reach the cells. And that is the problem I've seen with a lot of nutrients and vitamins and things with dogs. It, it goes through a pretty brutal, you know, area there in the stomach with this, uh, a lot of acidic, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, acids that they could kill because of the bacteria that could probably be in food and things when they eat in the wild, they eat often animals that have been laying around for weeks and weeks and weeks. And, and you can see these wild animals go and eat, you know, cadavers that are full of maggots and stuff and they still don't get sick no. and that's because of their their the, the composition of the stomach yeah, and i think exactly. the nutrients and capsules and and these things seem that we put in in our dogs is is i don't know how much that even ends up where it's supposed to end up in the cells so I, I there's know, um and i tested so many vi uh, supplements now i'm pro probably up to like 50 or 60 and in the most most cases, I see no difference. So, so when you're saying what was no difference in what? In 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 any improvement of, of oh. active feeding supplements in a capsule form, or I'm now testing more ionic supplements and and uh, on uh, liposomal supplements and see if that makes a difference. There's a there's a product um, that um, Ashley will tell you about. You know, I've been experimenting with with a group of people. And it's from humic acid and fulvic acid. It yeah. carries an ionic mineral yeah. uh, and electrolyte, meaning that for what it's from is uh, you get thousands of years of decay of plants and it makes these peat bogs. Yeah. And what's there now is a mineral that the human can take in. Yeah. As I'm hearing you speak about this, I think I'm going to give it to my dogs. So to your point, an animal can just eat raw, but there's some minerals that we have to be careful about because, not because the dog's flawed, um, you know, it's because the soil today is so depleted in certain minerals, particularly iodine. Now, magnesium is a tough one too, because a lot mm -hmm. of the, um, so magnesium might be another one that we'd have to worry about. I do, yeah. I supplement magnesium too, mm -hmm. yeah. M yeah. Uh, MSM, all this MSM. Okay. And, right. uh, and, and those are things, uh, yeah, because the soil is so ruined today. So if, they, if anything that grows in the regular soil have extremely, it's extremely poor in in um, in vitamins and, and nutrients, especially minerals. And I think actually there is a company here in Salt Lake that that get the minerals from underneath the lake. There and it seems to be that, and the Dead Sea is one of the richest mineral sources yeah. in the world. And they they I have seen difference in that. And yeah. I'm a little bit too early in the study, but the ones that that are now are supplementing with trace minerals are definitely seeing a difference. Another yeah. very interesting product I do a study on also with the, the way I do things, I get four or five dogs and we test the product, I test it, I take it myself. Anything I give my dog, I do too. Yeah, I, me too, yeah. Now, now I'm doing uh, more. I'm, I'm gonna send you that, uh, I'm gonna send you that, that humic acid, fulvic acid yeah, product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most of them are, uh, this one was tested, it's, it doesn't hold toxins, which is uh, yeah. a lot of those do because they come from the ground. I'm yeah. gonna send you that. I want. I want you to test it. I'm gonna to give it to my animal too, and uh, maybe I I'll have Ashley. Uh, Ashley, if anyone else wants to test it, I have a source that they can hook it up, and uh, Ashley can can make that. So if anyone else wants to try it, let's do a little experiment. I love doing that. <laughs> um, well, I'm in a unique situation because I can draw from all these six thousand people I have. They're, they're not all around me yeah. or anything, but they're all over the world. But they have a group that willing to test a little thing. Another thing, also probiotics that are now seeing it's, it's not almost not working. Um, other than these uh, soil-based probiotics, I'm doing a test on that now. I think that's going to work much, much better. That's what that would make more sense to me. Absolutely, probiotics, they're, they're they, created they, they, from they're the yeah, the, the, the probiotics created from a dairy, right? It's like uh, you know, the, in the wild, they're not getting that. They're not oh. getting that, but they would get hmm. soil organisms. Yes. Um, so I agree with you. The soil bacteria. Um, and we, we have a couple companies uh, that we do, folks. I'll, I'll put some links to soil yeah, bacteria. I want to I want to learn about what you had too, because I'm researching yeah. that and I'm testing a couple of two different soil-based spores. Yeah. Uh, and I, in theory, it seems like that's going to pass through the system and actually end up in the body much more than the regular probiotics that is so heat sensitive. Yeah. I used to get probiotics from a place in Tennessee were made to order. They make it, they freeze it and the ship is frozen so it's actually alive and i think you can get some benefit from that but it's still most of that's going to be killed in the well, stomach the, the high acidity even the high yes, exactly, carnivore, exactly, yes. it won't yes. survive it but the soil it doesn't bother the soil bacteria so okay so we have iodine we have magnesium we have minerals just certain you know minerals in general and then we have the the bacteria from soil 
I think all those with just raw meat, that's right now your recommendation, just straight up raw meat. Where can they buy it? I have a source that I have, but where, where do you buy? Where's your source? Give your I make source. my own. I make my own. Make own. I never bought it from anywhere. But there are people that can't make their own and they want to make their own. They are in a family situation where maybe one member don't want to have it, any raw meat in the house. The vegans, the hate touch, touching raw meat. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of people that can make it. So definitely there are... Uh, people that are in, need to buy pre-made raw meat and then you know that's a big risk you don't know sure. what you're getting so you need to do your 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 research very very carefully so a grass a farmer that does a hundred percent grass fed and grass finished that would be a good resource but there's Absolutely. certainly what about organ meats and what about bones because they eat bones they should be eating bones too they yeah they can i think most dogs what i stick to is chicken bones from chicken they can handle any type of chicken bone. If beyond that, turkey bones, yes, rabbits, things like that. You can get that online. It's starting to get expensive. I'm part of my research is to make raw feeding available to as many people as possible. So I actually buy my raw meat and everything in a regular grocery store. So trying to prove that you actually can do that, and we all know that is not the cleanest food in the world. You know, we know where most of those chicken coming from. But for me to tell everybody, you cannot feed raw unless you go and buy it from Whole Food or some other, you know, get super organic. People can't afford that. Most people yeah. can't afford it. It's enough people that can't even afford to buy the regular raw meat from the store. And then pre-made, again, is, is the most expensive type of food. So it, it's difficult for me to tell people that, you so, know, if you don't feed a raw food diet, you, you, you're slowly killing your dog. So I you're saying them, like, look, hey, you're better off just to save money. I mean, if you went to Sam's and just got yes. raw meat, um, you're better off than anything else. So don't let better. organic, the expensive organic be, um, a, now if you can afford the organic and 100% grass fed, by all means so do it. Good. But you're saying to go raw, it's so much more important to yes. be raw. Just go get some chicken and yes. some you know, yeah. meat or something. Okay, got it. That's why I like to, to supplement because they try to balance out that, you know, they, they, they you know, turn to find in a way because if you have a strong immune system you can you can deal with a lot of toxins or chemicals so if you feed a raw food diet you supplement pretty well you you can boost the immune system up to handling those toxins or chemicals that comes with that not so perfect food in my in my my theory and then if you also then exercise your dog extensively you you will purge these things Pretty well. I mean the proof is that my my Danes that live to 13 and 14 I never been on that or get, never had a piece of organic meat in their life. Yeah, okay. It's, it's yeah. part of my study and I'd rather experiment on my own dogs and see what they do. The many that does the same in my study, probably three, 400 that, that, or more than that, that feed the feed that, uh, food from the regular grocery store. Well, Thomas, you, I tell you, I mean, I, I, I think it's great advice. I, the, the raw is so much more important. You know, just get, you know, raw meat, chicken, mm -hmm. uh, you know, chicken bones, because dogs do in fact need bones, right? I mean, every once in a while you can give them a, a cow bone from a, <laughs> you know, as a treat. Um, but yeah, so, you know, is there, is there any need to mix it up? I mean, should they do, you know, um, beef sometimes, lamb sometimes, chicken sometimes, a little bit of fish here and there? I mean, what's, uh, what's the advice? Well, I think that is very, very important. You, you need to figure, try to get access to three to four different type of proteins. Yeah, I agree. I'm actually very fortunate. The, the store out in Camus here is unbelievable. The Camus food store. Yeah, it, man, Thomas and I actually live actually right by each other. So I'm going, where? Where is this? You know where you can do there? I buy cases of, of kidney. I buy cases of splee, uh, pancreas. I buy cases of turkey necks, which is not, you know, it's, it's not organ meat, but I get three or four different organ meats from that store and that's not normal. And you can buy cases of it, so you don't have to go there every day to buy. Oh man, they probably have elk there too. So many people hunt elk. And I get elk around from hunters here once yeah. in a while, but uh, it is, it's not anything I can get on a regular basis. But in that store, I get beef, turkey, I can get, um, and then gizzards, of course, and then I can get uh, the um, pork, and uh, what else do I get? Lamb. Those are expensive, but that's mainly you can uh, get yeah. three, four different proteins. Well, you know, liver, I, liver will always be should be one of your things you feed. Okay. So five to. Five and how to, much do you put in? How much organ meat versus other meat, regular meat? 
I follow, uh, which is, nothing is said in stone, but I roughly do like an 80% meat, 10% bone. I'm actually higher on bones and higher on organ meat. So maybe 70% meat, then about 10 to 20% uh, bones, and then 10 to 15% uh, organ meats. It's just roughly, roughly, roughly. And, and folks watching this, if you think, well, you know, this would be harder, can't for my dogs have never been sick. My 11 year old, no, no. he's never been to the vet, not one time. He still runs, you know, like the Dickens is what I say. <laughs> he still runs by me on, the, on my mountain bike. I mean, come on, you know, he has no arthritis. You know, he's, uh, he's amazing. So, you know, I mean, this is these, you're going to save money on vet bills. Trust me. And you're going to oh keep your gosh. pet alive without debilitating arthritis and all the, you know, hair and skin problems. If you saw my dogs, you know, they can't believe my dog's 11 years old. You know, he's still, no, no, nobody can. I, mean, see, I can tell a raw fed dog from a cable fed dog yeah. almost yeah. immediately. I see the muscle mass. I see the shininess in the coat. I see the, even the look in their eyes, you know, they look more alive. They look like hell. They, there's something there. And I, I can tell right away. Yeah. And definitely on the poop, you know, then that's a giveaway. Yeah. But, but uh, what keeps, since we're talking about all these uh, different meats, what keep people away from raw food is the, false and the misunderstanding of balance how balance works they think they have to balance the food and we get that from the kibble bags you know because yeah, that's yeah. that's number one argument from a vet that said you're never going to be able to balance a raw food diet and he absolutely right you can never do that yeah. and you don't need to, don't need to. No need. the balance happened from within you just you provide the resources that the body need and a dog need, and then the body will figure out how to balance. It will take what it needs. If there's certain things it doesn't need, it just purge it. If there's something they need for organ research, it will store it. It's the easiest way to feed a dog. There is no calculations, there's no nothing. You just kind of do that 80, 10, 10, 80, 15, 70, 15, 15, sort of. You don't have to even think about that. It's just after, this is what I tell how people get on a raw food diet. Forget everything about balance or anything just feed chicken for a week or two nothing else just yeah. stay the chicken during that time they did they're going to see a big difference in their dog and they're going to get so encouraged to continue and then they said okay after a week or two take two or three ounces out of, from the chicken and then replace it with some red meat or something else and then you keep doing that till you get to a point where you feed a variety in the same bowl that's fine you don't have to do one thing one day, one thing other day, and that just complicates it. If you want to do that later, that's fine. But do all in one bowl and just keep replacing and come up with four to five different organ meat, nine, nine, uh, proteins, and then two to three, three different organ meats. Add an egg two to three times a week, and you have an almost absolute perfect meal for a dog. I was going to ask you about eggs. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, two, three you times a week. Okay. You have to be a raw. All cook. right. Yeah. And we talked about supplementation. Uh, what about detox? Um, you know, it's something that, you know, humans, we have to do now because of our environment. What, what, what do you think with dog? Well, the, the, if I get a dog from kibble to raw, what I do then ask them to fast for 48 hours to bring that dog into ketosis. I am a big opponent of a, a, a food in the induced ketosis in dogs. This is, it's not a good thing. You can you, you do it with fasting, and it goes much faster too. And uh, if you want to do that once a week, it's perfect. Fasting for a dog is how, how long? How long do you fast? Forty-eight. I would do a forty-eight hour fast if you come from kibble to raw, and then immediately you go to raw. Forget all the kibble, throw it out. Don't do a mix. Some people like to mix it up and I don't say not to do it. I would never do it. I've never done it. I, I switch so many dogs to raw and we all do, you know, cold turkey. And, and that works much, much better. You know, I, I wanted to ask you, that was one of my questions. You keep nailing them. That's great. Um, about fasting, because I believe humans are programmed to fast. We need yeah. to fast. Yeah. So I mean, let's say we have a healthy dog. We're not switching. My dog, for example. How often Absolutely. should I throw a day or two fast in? I fast my dogs either on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. I just don't give them any food that day. But I also feed once a day. And I highly, I, I highly recommend it. Because yeah. then you go into like a, a, a mini, sort of like a mini ketosis in the end of that. intermittent fasting daily. Yes, so absolutely. Just like today, I'm going to yeah. eat one meal a day me, right? I, yeah. I, that's what I do, right? I do the I same. I do that every day, but I do that many days. Um, I've, been in, I've been practicing a ketogenic diet for five years, six years. 
I started with the Atkinson in first time I went on Atkinson diet for 1996. I never had a weight problem or anything. I, I always done weightlifting and a little bit bodybuilding stuff like that. So experimenting with a, a Atkinson diet. And when I did that, it was in a, I used to be in a gym business. I opened gyms all over the world. And I had a, uh, uh, had opened two or three gyms in Hawaii. So I lived in Hawaii. And I started on Atkinson diet. And I I got so many people, what are you trying to do? You're trying to kill yourself? Look at all the fat you're eating, all the butter you're eating. What are you crazy? You don't eat any vegetable fruits, nothing. I did eat vegetable fruits, but on the side. But they, I did, they scared me. I, at one point said, you know, maybe they're right because I couldn't find any sort of research that this is, you know, could go wrong. I, I wish now, I no, I don't really wish, but I'd stayed on it for a year and I wish I kind of continued it because I got back on more carbs and all that and I never felt that good as I did back then. It's all a, thinking back, gosh, I felt good on that day. Charles, you should read my book, uh, my book called Beyond Fasting. I, yeah. I talk about diet variation, right, yeah. in humans and yeah. you know, how important that is, right? And Because uh, we, we're not full carnivores, right? So how to go no, from we don't know. And you know how to move in and out of ketosis and some yeah. other different diets because that's what cultures did. Humans, yeah, absolutely. they were forced to change our diet, right? And sometimes yeah. we were full blown carnivore diets. Sometimes yeah, yeah. we're plant based diets. Sometimes. <laughs> so. No, exactly, and that's that's the whole problem. We're so disconnected from what we were designed to live as and eat. So we now, yeah, we live in this society full of like a synthetic type society and and the disconnect is so big i mean need to get that gap narrow that gap and go back to what we were designed to absolutely eat and, and live like and all that and that's exactly what you're doing so then, here's the, here's my wife uh, oh that was your wife uh, okay hi I read your article um about your pets and, oh, very yeah, good. And, uh, oh, right. You live here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm right. over here. At one value I, I've over. already learned so much. I, I've That's learned fantastic. so much. Yeah. Oh, hi, yeah, I, I'll share it with you. I, this what is a, a great episode. Dog. It's a great That's day. Great day. Yeah. I thought so. Doubles their age. He's a puppy. Uh -huh. he, he's uh -huh. Very so. good. Awesome. So nice to meet you. I'm so glad. Yeah, nice to meet you, too. Nice to meet yeah. you, too. I'm glad you reached out. Oh, okay. here's, here's I'm sure we'll be seeing each other. No, I'm glad you wrote that. Article. I mean, yeah. we need to come from a little bit outside this raw feeding community because we are a very close, <laughs> small community in a sense. But you know, when you think about it, it's probably two to three percent that feed raw. Everybody else. Yeah, you know, there's a there's a girl where I my groomer in Heber, um, Tracy. She has Mountain Dog Lounge. You might want to reach out to her because she also feeds her Frenchie and her Visla both raw. Yeah, and, um, oh, and that's where I go to the groomer. But anyway, she's fantastic. In fact, I think she's going to start carrying some raw food, so you might even be able to influence her. Yeah, All right, absolutely. take care. Nice so, to okay, you. well, listen, this is awesome stuff. Um, okay, this is a topic that uh, near and dear to my heart. Well, you know, we've been talking about dogs, though. I mean. Let, let's just you know talk about i have two cats here that eat all raw in the summer they eat mostly mice honestly with a little bit of uh, raw that we give them um but in the winter time we we get, have to give them more food the same things apply to cats absolutely i have two cats too who were actually rescued by my my Odin, my other great dane founded one year apart in in my yard on each corner i thought it, first one i thought it was a rat and said oh my gosh that's like a kind of a big rat it was just a kitten mm -hmm. and i don't know somebody dropped it off same thing happened a year after i put them both directly on a raw food diet and i've been on raw ever since and these are the healthiest cats people ever. You know, my cats unbelievable I, if my wife drags my one of them in you'll you'll see them they're main coons i have one that's uh um huge i mean literally <laughs> out, outweighs my uh dog so oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah i i literally he's at 35 pounds the cat Wow, he's all no, they're not he, even he, close he's to all raw in mice. That's so how much like, do you feed him? I, well, you know, I, well, my wife probably overfeeds them because, um, you know, in the summer they just eat what they get, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah they bother us at night if we don't feed them more. But the, the cats eat twice a day, whereas our dogs just eat once a day. I, yeah. I don't know why they eat twice a day, just because they demand it. Well, the many online have said that you can't. I, I, for the longest time, just fed my cats once a day. And I, you know, if I ever say that online, I get a lot of, you know, criticism for doing that because they think cats have to eat several times a day. 
but uh, I don't see why, because in the wild, they wouldn't be able to find food every, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it just seems twice a day. Just well, when down, they get sick, I... they can go, you know, if they get sick or eat something, and, and they can go without food two or three days, which is not recommended. I tell people never to do that, but I have witnessed it. So yeah. These cats well, can survive fine. My father-in-law, my father-in-law trapped by accident in a shed outside his house. And he trapped his cat in there for three months. No. Didn't have didn't have water. I mean, no it, ate, it ate bugs. It it just ate spiders and insects, and it oh, lived. Yeah. That's I is that an amazing it. story or what? It was like ah, when it came out, but it lived. It lived. Yeah, according to every vet, everybody around the cat expert, that would never never happen. They will die after three days. Uh, you know, that is amazing. No, it was just eating. Or maybe it grabbed a mouse or two. I doubt. Uh, it, it must I, have I because know. you know they, they get it water from and my cats barely drink any water my well, dance doesn't we drink theorize water. that there may have been like a, a slight leak or so when it rained it may yes. have been just yeah. enough water that would come in on certain storms they don't need much you know they yeah, don't because he saw where there could have been a little bit of water but anyway yeah just so he might have gotten some water but obviously they're days without water so anyway interesting story the cats are, are uh you know that's amazing i never heard that oh my gosh so anyway, let's talk about the, uh, and again, I, you're not going to make any recommendations here. I don't recommend, I don't, <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to make recommendations here, but there's a lot of controversy around vaccines. And I'm going to, I'll just yes. tell this story. Um, just this week, um, I think it was Monday. So just two days ago, uh, there was a story, my wife's Facebook, the um, person just got their puppy vaccinated in the, in the dog was screaming um, in pain. And now I've heard this story again and again and again. And it's a story that I can only say to people watching, you need to educate yourself. I tell the same story about humans, educate yourself. I'm not gonna tell you when to vaccinate or not vaccinate. I don't think you're going to make that risk either. However, um, educate yourself. What would you say on this topic? No, I, I, exactly what you said. I, 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 for my own sake, I vaccinate as little as I can legally. I would, uh, I, I'm told against it because I think it's an unnatural uh, way of, of uh, create immunity. Uh, dogs and humans, all that, normally when we create some sort of immunity or get a virus, we get it through the mouth, the nose, maybe eyes, and you get captured by the mucus system. So it already there is getting sort of encapsulated and diluted. The mucus system would then send signal to the body. Wait, hey, something's coming down. Start making antibodies. Yeah. So the process is beautiful. It, it's, it's it's a nature process of, of creating antibodies and start the process of immunity. It's sticking a needle straight into the body with a massive amount of vi this this virus and right. combined with chemicals and other things to carry this into the bloodstream. It's completely unnatural. It doesn't happen anywhere. That's something we invented. Right. So somebody that has a, a compromised immune system and had other maybe problems, stress and all that, can have a massive antibody reaction, so massive that he actually just kills the body. And that I've seen dogs that died, not seen, but you know, people in my I've study. I've seen dogs die just immediately after vaccine. Yeah, and then there are a couple of horrifying things with the brain swelled up in a dog. It happens you know, to kids, it happens to children. Yeah, it's, 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 so, so, so to me, it's, um, I believe in natural vaccination. And I know people that actually get a puppy not vaccinated, take him to the dog park, walk through the dog park, hoping to pick up something at one point, go home, see if the dog is fine, and then try to do it again to so catch some, you know, viruses. And, by the way, that was the old way of vaccinating when we were kids. Yeah, oh, and, and it old, works. There's mumps, there's chicken pox, you send your kid down, that's what my yeah, parents did. exactly, yeah. that's what they did, yeah, and why won't we do that now? No, we know the reason why we don't, can't do that, but... Oh, yeah, there's again, a lot of money to be made, and again, Educate yourself, folks. There's another side to this story. You know, it definitely is, and then that's what I recommend to just go on and, and Google vaccination in dogs. You know, are you for, are you against it? And you can find some really good articles. But with anything you search on online, you get pretty much 50%, you know, saying one thing, 50% saying another thing. You, you, it, it's, but you know, use your, use your, so, uh, your recommendations feed raw there's certain uh, depletion that we talked about because of soil iodine magnesium you know that we can look at some mineral 
uh, that's missing in the soil. We talked about probiotics, not regular probiotics, but soil, because of course that's what dog, animal carnivores would be exposed to. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about, um, you know, we talked about the, the need for exercise. We didn't really focus a lot on that, but you know, I mean, how much exercise would you say? You know, I mean, I, I, my dogs run a lot because I mountain bike, but the average person's not going to do that. What would you recommend? Well, if you understand why you want to exercise, and the main reason for exercise is, is, is more than the cardiovascular system, is the lymphatic system. Because the lymphatic system is not working if the dog is not moving. And the same with humans. If you say still all day, your lymphatic system is not doing its job, but it, what is the main job is to purge toxins and chemicals, waste products that the body creates all the time, and also what we're breathing in and they get exposed to. So the moment you start moving, and, and then the pump, that's the pump, the muscle, the movement of the body is the pump for the lymphatic system, and that only works when we move. So I tell people, especially I deal with a lot of dogs with cancer, and I see an enormous difference in the success rate of dogs that are exercised or those that are not getting any exercise. And I'm not talking about anything crazy. You probably are way over what you need by running your dog oh, like yeah. that. And it's going to extend their life tremendously. But also when you recover from any type of, of disease, if you practice fasting, combined with a lot of exercise, it just not to be those crazy running around. I know, you want your attention. Fasting was another big one that I, I probably need to add more of. You know, my, my wife's a softie. Oh, you know, we understand. We fast all the time, right? You know, but you know what? I am fasting them because I'm feeding them once a day. And that was yes, another thing. Yes, you know, perfect, yeah, perfect. So That's folks, right. listen, you, if you're out there, feed your Absolutely. dog once a day because that gets a fasting. And my, my yeah. followers understand the benefits of fasting, you know, but they probably don't understand it for their animals, you know, but one, once a day, then every once in a while, you said once a week, just go a day without food, correct? Yeah. yeah. And then you can maybe one in a month on to something you go two days without food they don't my dogs would never if i didn't start preparing the food my dog wouldn't know they won't get food because there is the sound of me making food that get them excited so the days i don't do anything they just later like they never even ask for it they don't understand because they don't hear those signals that i'm making food oh. so not feeding it doesn't bother them one bit you and i yeah. suffer more thinking they're starving you know, you're the one that suffer when, when we do it. But we know, look at, we can just look at animals when they got sick, they lose their appetite. That's the number one way for them to start their healing process. Absolutely. Because the process of digesting food is like, it's resourceful. They take all the Absolutely. resources. So you know that. And, and that's what, so we the kind of program to believe that when we get sick and we lose our appetite, oh, you need to eat something, you need to eat something, oh, you need some soup, you need this and this. No, my body well, telling me, I don't want anything, I would just want water, don't give me anything. <laughs> so that's, that's, you know, back in the Middle Ages, that's the first, if they had a, got a sick person, faster them. Yeah, that's no what food, we do. No nothing. That was the first thing they did. My, and from cooling and, and heating, cooling and heating, cooling and heating, you know, drive, and drive those toxins out of the body and help the body to maximize its resources, not used on digestion, but for healing. And the same with dogs. We so, fast, I, my wife and I fast five days, uh, four times a year. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And that, that, that I know people with dogs that do maybe every quarter, they do a three or four or five day fast on their dogs. And I think wow. that's extremely healthy. Yeah, yeah. They're, meant, they're, they're programmed genetically for it, like we are as humans. Dogs will instinctively fast, as you pointed out, when they're hurt, sick, or you know whatever it is. Humans, mm, not so much. Um. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I, they don't find food every day in the yeah. wild. You know, they they are ninety nine point eight percent similar to wolves. They are descendants of wolves. They have everything a wolf has in it, but especially when it comes to the digestive system and all things. That's not, not everybody agree, but I have never seen any proof that they're not. So that's what wolves don't eat every day. Mm -hmm. And yes, right. they nibble on fruits, other things, and you know, do you know famine and things like that. But it, it, and then people say, "Oh, we got to get blueberries. Oh, we got to get these little fruits and stuff because they have all these antioxidants in it and so forth." Yeah, yeah. But yes, for us maybe they can work a little bit, but uh, it doesn't really. Well, we don't opinion. produce our own vitamin C, and we again, if you're not, if you're on a pure carnivore diet, you don't need the level of antioxidants. Obviously, you don't need it. No, I think raw food, fasting, lots of exercise, 
and I claim this, and I said it many times on my website, you can reduce the risk of cancer down to less than 3%. By adding some cancer-fighting supplements, I think we can all together protect the dog from ever getting cancer. I know I sound crazy, but my study over 20 years now with 6,000 dogs and they're all fed, and many of these dogs are now outlived their lives. And the percentage of dogs that get cancer in my study is less than 3%. Well, and, and the percentage of dogs getting cancer today, unbelievably 60 high. to 70 percent, I think yeah. it's higher. Yeah. Over 10 years, over 10 years old, almost probably 80, 90 percent of dogs will die from cancer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, think about that now, 60 70 percent. And then when you feed raw, and the dogs in my study, since I now have almost 6,000 dogs, I'm going to go to 10,000, and they're going to be a lifetime report on these dogs. So all I can, I, I can my, my uh, control is sort of what's reported, the statistics that's out there, the, the veterinarian report when it comes to chronic diseases, cancer, and all these things that take dogs. I documenting the same thing. I know it's not scientific. Nobody could afford a lifetime, 30 years scientific study for my doing. So it is sort of, of course of an observational study, but it's gonna have some value to it because I think I, I would show that less than five, maybe 3% of these dogs got cancer. I can always already now, the few dogs that are getting cancer now, I can tell why they did it. They got into some, they either did a vaccination, they did some other things, and they had a dog that they didn't know the past. You know, a lot of these dogs are rescue dogs and we don't really know the past, but we know every time a dog get adopted out and come back in, they get vaccinated. And some of these dogs are adopted in and out two or three times. So they could be in a horrible situation in the beginning. So, but a draw fed puppy and up, I don't see any cancer in these dogs, yeah. and that's yeah. it's unbelievable, you know? Thomas, you uh, Thomas Seyfried is a scientist. Um, yeah, I know him. Yeah, yeah, you him. know Thomas, human Absolutely. cancer. But he, um, I was in a, a little mastermind with him, and uh, he said, oh my gosh, Dan, you have to get this, I have to send you this study on Oscar the dog. Right? Yeah. It was back from the early 1900s. Yeah. But what happened was, is they were fasting dogs to find out where their primordial state was, meaning how long would they fast before they live? Well, Oscar kept finding food and breaking out of the study. And then, you know, they would start another study and 30 days in, Oscar found food. So Oscar did so many fasts, right? Because they kept putting him in the next study. Mm -hmm. Well, he ended up after 101 days, he was just water, 101 days. They, they said in the study that Oscar was jumping in and out of his cage. They literally had to stop the fast because yeah. they couldn't kill Oscar. So Oscar <laughs> outlived them because he had fasted so many fasts. He kept getting healthier and healthier and yeah, healthier. Absolutely. To the point where he went 101 days and he wasn't dying anytime mm -hmm. soon. Uh, so pretty amazing. There's a, a human fasted uh, you know, 289 days, you know what I mean? So there's um, a lot of room for fasting. But the point was I wanted to make about Thomas Saber. He gave me that study. You would enjoy reading it. But he said that a human fasting one fast a year decreases their cancer at 95%. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so we would see the same with dogs, obviously. Well, we see it in certain religion, religious groups. They have fasting is a big thing in, in some of them. And they are super healthy. There's a group yeah. down, I can't remember where they are, down in LA, that the cancer rates is super low. And yeah. they do a lot of fasting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I always say fasting. Every religious group dif differs on everything, even prayer. So yeah. One thing, fasting. Yeah, they do. You know, they knew. They knew. Fasting. They knew. They, there was a, that, that's a healing type of, you know, modality is fasting. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it, it's exciting. Well, Thomas, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it was yeah. Great. We could I, go on for hours. I know. We could go on for hours. And, uh, you know, it's uh, obvious every it's, time. Of the hour, but yeah, it was a fantastic show. Great advice on the raw, on fasting, um, intermittent fasting, feeding your dog once a day, the supplementation, great advice. Um, just amazing. So thank you so much, Thomas. No, you're welcome. More than welcome. I'm really nice to finally meeting you. Yes, likewise. Yeah. And if you need any help in anything, you know what to find me soon. Yeah, thank you. All right. And we'll put your information here as well in the links right. so people can find you. Thanks, Thomas. Thanks. Awesome. Yeah, bye. Well, that's it for this week. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. This episode was brought to you by Cyto Detox. Please check it out at buycytonow.com. We'll be back next week and every Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. 
We truly appreciate your support. You can always find us at CellularHealing.tv and please remember to spread the love by liking, subscribing, giving an iTunes review, and sharing the show with anyone you think may benefit from the information heard here. And as always, thanks for listening.